Okay, great. Welcome everybody to this uh, Thursday. Today's Thursday, um, June 25th, uh, Ballard Institute Puppet Forum, online puppet forum with uh, Peter and Elka Schumann, surprise guest Elka Schumann. And uh, my name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry. And when the COVID-19 situation started, we decided to go online with a bunch of uh, puppet forums to talk about uh, puppet history or, and puppetry in general. And uh, to last, uh, last week, we spoke with Scott Shershaw more about the nature of puppetry and puppetry studies. And today, we're honored to have as our guests uh, from Glover, Vermont, Peter and Elka Schumann, uh, who uh, started the Bread and Puppet Theater in 1963. Long story. Uh, Peter uh, and, and Elka did a, an online interview with Frank Henschke from uh, CUNY Graduate Center a few weeks ago, which is available online. Uh, what's called a Live from the Siegel Center, I think, uh, which where uh, uh, there was a very good discussion about um, the nature of bread and puppet theater. And today uh, I wanted to talk uh, with, with Peter and with Elka about, about bread and puppet and, and what the theater's doing now. When, when Peter and I spoke uh, on the phone a couple of weeks ago about doing this, uh, Peter said, the important thing is the moment. How do we treat it? How do we treat other people in this moment? Uh, we need to deal with the real reality not the fake reality. And of course, this moment is a very charged moment. Uh, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and also in the United States and around the world, there have been uh, massive street demonstrations, mostly spurred by the deaths of uh, African-Americans at the hands of the police. Uh, so we're in a very particular particularly interesting moment and and the possibilities of puppetry and and political puppetry to respond to that moment are are many and bread and puppet is responding to that and we wanted to talk about that so greetings peter and elka how are you today yeah i'm pretty fine, good fine, right. fine. good yeah <laughs> we uh we wanted to show uh, some short clips of the performances you've been doing in Glover at the Bread and Puppet Theater for the past three weeks, I think, uh, titled Insurrection and Resurrection Services. And um, I, we wanted to talk about that and talk about some other aspects of, of the work and also uh, take into account any questions or comments that, that people might, might have. I, I noticed folks uh, like our, our friend Pupak from Tehran is, is watching, along with many other um, Pupak. exciting people in the world, Red and mm -hmm. Puppet fans and hopefully others. So what, just um, as a prelude to showing some of these clips, could, could you tell us, Peter and Elko, what you've been doing recently and how you've been responding to, to this particular moment in history? Well, the, um, the, the, the virus, the harshness of all these separations, people can't be together. We weren't even sure we could be with our grandchildren. We can't visit our friend Bert Porter who's dying in a nursing home. We, it's all of this, it's so severe. And then you go into a market and you realize that so and so many people, younger folks walk around without masks, even though the advice is, please don't do that. And so there are so many different ways of taking this. But our overall impression was that what's missing is the acknowledgement of the many unfuneralized people in this, the missing lamentations, the missing uh, view 
from the other side of those people who die and who should actually be active in our life as they wish to be. They all had lives that want to contribute to afterlife and to our life. And those uh, we call resurrections. And we feel both that and the insurrection against this lousy system that is so responsible for these many thousands of unnecessary deaths. And the call for insurrection against that is the other part of it. I, I, we wanted to show this, this uh, some, some video that uh, Jerome Lapani uh, from Montpelier area uh, put together. And I wondered, if, especially for those who might not be familiar with Bread and Puppets work in, in Glover, where the theater is based, if, if you could explain the nature of the spaces where the shows happen, especially the Pine Forest, um, uh, where, where part of the show happens, because that's a, a in thinking of um, uh, honoring the dead, that, that's a very special place for that. Yeah, it sure is. After you want to say a few pine forest words. Well, just to, just to locate it across from the museum, from the Bread and Puppet Museum, you cross the road and go into a big, big meadow, which is about 24 acres of rolling, gently rolling hills and slopes. And then at the edge of that is a thick pine forest that was planted in the 30s and early 40s under a government program. The trees were put in in rows and they were supposed to be thinned out, which didn't happen. So they're too dense, but it's a beautiful area with, the, with all these vertical pine trees there. And we started in the early years when we moved to, the, to this place, we began grow, um, building uh, like Memorial memorials sites. to yeah. friends who had passed away or old puppeteers or- And family members. And family members. And so it's grown into a, an area of the pine forest has become a whole little village of structures and memorials to these friends. So it seemed to be just the correct place to go in there and do our lamenting in there. And that's what we are doing. That's part of it. I wanted to explain that, that the company you're working with, um, in addition to being a, a, an array of highly talented young puppeteers and artists and dancers and writers and musicians, they, they had been planning to do a nationwide bread and puppet tour that was going to last quite a number of months that ca came to a halt in in uh, earlier mid-march when the covid 19 pandemic started and they've been um quarantining at the farm so you'll you'll see that group performing but they've basically been together as a pod as the term goes um uh since since march so they've been all together and and I guess separated from 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 Peter and Elka, right? Yeah, and they they two of us interrupted the last show they did was in front of the White House, a protest protest piece, and the cops came there and uh, dispersed them, <laughs> and they then traveled home. Uh, those that still succeeded to go over borders went home to Nova Scotia and wherever. And then eight of them got stuck on the farm, and that's our new company. And three of them were the resident puppeteers, and the others were all members of the touring company. There were 20 of them total. And so now the eight of them have to do the work of that normally at this time of year is between 75 and 120 people on the farm. And that is a huge amount of different kind of work is unimaginable. Broken septic tanks and big right. gardens and uh, totally uh, messed up unpacking areas. We have so much storage and the storage is automatically from overload, messy, but now more than ever because there was no time to do organized cleaning and packing away. 
so they have an, a, a, a real overload. So it's very hard to pull them together to do rehearsals, but they were so spirited. When we came back, there was still snow. What was that, March, right? March. And they immediately set out to practice a snow pageant. Right. And that they did, and they realized they couldn't have big audiences. So instead of advertising it, they invited neighbors to it. So they did a few of those. Then we started working on tabletop shows, little shows, that uh, on subject matter that we felt needed to be brought to the attention of the public. And yeah, and then we went as soon as we could into the pine forest and did things there. So, so the theaters, uh, you're working together with a company on a much smaller scale than normal and you're making new shows and performing new shows and um, I think we'll, maybe we'll talk about it later, but you're planning to perform all through the summer um, yeah. in a healthy way d despite yeah. the COVID situation. Right, so we do very small audiences, originally 10, now we are allowed 25, but we are deciding ourselves when that seems too many. And then Saturday, Sunday, we do, hopefully, if it doesn't rain, these lamentations and insurrection resurrection services. And then mid-July, we want to start circuses. So instead of continuing on improving and changing the existing services, we want to use that time to develop circus acts to slowly integrate neighbors into them, which is difficult because of all the distancing that needs to be uh, observed, but we will do that. And then the circus ring, the amphitheater that we have, an old gravel pit transformed into our amphitheater, is so big that you could have those 150, everybody 30 feet apart if you wanted to. But we've, no already, we've already moved into the pageant field. Yes, we do a, already part use of the pageant field, mm -hmm. those 25 acres of meadow that are between Pine Forest and Museum. Yeah. So maybe we could let, why don't we show this first clip, which is the beginning of the um, Insurrection and Resurrection Services show. And this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, footage uh, Jerome Lapani shot on June 13th, when it seems like it was a chilly, uh, chilly day that day. So, um, Emily, thank you. <laughs> for the combined insurrection and domestic resurrection services. Right this way. Thank you.
credentials. Ah! Ah! We non-essentialists must deliver the missing insurrection and resurrection services that the moment ah, requires. was the first clip and there are a few I think maybe three more of those uh, panel performances or contestorias that um, uh, leading people down into the pine forest uh, as, as short as the ones we just saw that it, it the later shows uh, in the pine forest we'll see are very colorful but these these uh, panels are, are very black and white. Did, why, why did you choose th that, that palette? Oh, well, the, the starkness of black and white is the strongest for narration purposes, for bringing things across. It's like in the old Hogarth style of, or <laughs> yeah, it's a look through the history of graphics, the chapbooks and the broad sheets that were used before we had radio and all that, that is their strength to be black and white and as simple as black and white is. But the, uh, and the, the performers who you saw on the fiddles, Josh and Amelia, they were also the team that printed those things. So I carved them on masonite sheets, cheapest way of getting any printing done. And they printed them with Lila Winstead in our print shop on bed sheets, and that a friend of ours donated last spring, and this spring another load of them, and we call it the bed bed sheet philosophy. It's available without any going on onto any market at all. It's from the from the dumpster of a hotel in southern Vermont. And they, after the printing, we decided to hang them in that part of the pine forest and to make it just a, a short upper part of the pine forest that's occupied. 
by about a dozen of those. It makes so the the you carved uh, like very. It looks like very large uh, masonite and, panels. Yeah, four these. by eight sheets. Right, the whole panel is uh, four feet by eight feet. Are those the largest masonite? No, those aren't the largest masonite panels you've done, are, no, are they? The, I remember you were in it when we did the Iraq ones, the big flags, those were bigger. Okay. Yeah, they were longer. They were like 12 feet tall, I think. Wait, remember the Iraq banners. Yeah, I'm, anyway, yeah. I'm thinking that people who might not be familiar with bread and puppet theater might be surprised who might be accustomed to tr more traditional puppet theater might be surprised that this is considered by bread and puppet to be a form of puppet theater. But do you, what, what would you say to someone who's, I, who's saying, what is this? It's a performance with a, a big painting <laughs> rather than a puppet. <laughs> well, we do that a lot, you know, any, any little object you pick up the, this is, a, this puppet is called a water glass, you know, right. this is a microphone. These are all puppets that pretend to be other beings, but we also utilize them in that way, that way so that they can speak to us. Same thing of any sheet of fabric or anything that we can paint or print on. Yep, there it is. But the, but the painted, painted uh, performances are part of an old tradition from Italy called Contestoria, where, a, where different panels would have parts of a story painted on and a narrator would tell the story and there might be a chorus echoing his words and singing it and passing out leaflets or uh, Yeah, and not just from Italy. The, in Iran, the, we have the Tazge, it's the wonderful huge paintings that are used for their festivals in China and India. We once at uh, John, I think you were there at the Smithsonian Folk Festival. We met an Indian family with an old right. painting from the Mahabharata, with which that family had made a living for 800 years. So if you want to make a living for 700 years, better start going on them. Well, one, the, one thing I noticed about the, the, the insurrection and resurrection services is that like the, your sense of structure, I, I was thinking you, you always have a very clear sense of structure. And there's this section here, the black and white sort of introductory uh, perhaps section that uh, Josh Krogman um, and, and Amelia are, are, are doing. And uh, and then it moves into a colorful, more colorful banner section, as Elka was saying. And then there's an, a section out in the pageant field. Are you? Um, how do you think of structure? That did were you thinking? I want to do this in three parts. This whole larger show. Do you think of the structure of of a show at, at altogether at first, or are you creating the structure as you go along? As we go along, but the juxtapositioning of these opposites is extremely useful. Also, the space uses, the darkness in the pine forest where black and white is especially strong, or the brass band outside in the great field, you know, amongst the green and the clouds are the most mm -hmm. important part of the spectacle. Mm -hmm. And then you go deep into the pine forest and then all of a sudden you utilize bright colors to contradict that darkness. Yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think that's like, I, I didn't mention that, uh, like that I was together with my wife Trudy, part of the Bread and Puppet Company for many years and, and of course learned a great bit, especially about color um, among other things. But um, uh, what, the, these shows in a way remind me of some of the roots of Bread and Puppet in the happenings and performance art uh, shows in the early 60s that you participated in in New York, like um, I think there was one called Ergo Suits. Um, I forget what it's called, but, yes. but outdoors and there. Ergo Suits, yes. Yeah. Very interesting, yeah. Oh but, my God, yeah, old happening makings, yes. That was a great moment in theatrics there in New York, that moment 
when painters and sculptors and dancers decided, ah, oh, forget about the uh, uh, theater director and the writer and, and a bunch of educated actors and the cleaning woman and the war. No, we don't need any of that. We are just going to use our paintings, our our wordings, our musics, our sculpture, and do activities and compose things out of arbitrary fragments of materials of everyday life mixed with what we make. And it, it was a very bright moment. There were really beautiful things there that were performed. Uh, I don't know if any of that survived or something that continues, but I'm sure it educated the, the young people who are studying theater nowadays. You know, yeah, I, I think they, it's studied, you know, as a part of history, but, but and it interests me that to a certain extent, I mean, you do many, many different types of shows and some are more formal theatrical shows, but this, this to my mind, Brings brings to my mind the, the those those happenings that the, which you just described very nicely. Maybe we can go to the next clip, which is uh, the next part of the insurrection and resurrection services. Insurrection and resurrection services presents the praise and denunciation show. Oh. for your pleasure at their traditional 4.26 o'clock dance. <laughs> change their ways and sprout rise from their otherwise infertile heads. <laughs> yes! yes. For 
is me. That make excellent salad. Therefore, we present to you Mother Earth. Oh! Fredolin, her children. Dandelion salad. Oh. And now we'll try another jolly dandelion dance. Traditionally done eh? for Jenny Shaw. <laughs> Dandelions on the dance perform at 435 South. <laughs>
that leave out the majority of its customers. And here you see economy's customers drowning and struggling in economy's ocean as the flames of hell move towards them. We cut it there. There's <laughs> more. Um, and I, I, my colleague, Emily, or my other colleague, Felicia, posted the link to the entire uh, video that Jerome Lapani made, if people want to see that on, on the Facebook comments. But uh, w in, when I look at this, Peter, um, the, the, these uh, excerpts from this larger show, I think, first of all, that it seems to me the nature of this is as a kind of evolving work in progress, like because um, the previous video uh, had some different elements to it, and and it seemed I, I think of the work you're doing over the summer as sort of always capable of changing. It's it's not that you're trying to create a set piece, but I I wondered also for those of us who are familiar with kind of the, the theatrical language of bread and puppet, all of these different elements make sense or are familiar to us, but your use of, of paintings or, or oversized prints that we were talking about earlier and your use of um, instrumental music like the violins and voice and choreography, um, uh, they're not, like a typical theater piece or or puppet show, certainly. And I wondered how you think about all of these different elements and how they, they're put together. Or is it just because you've been doing it so long that it's it's a language that you're just working and living in? <laughs> well, the, the background for these particular shows was uh, they had a period of painting time where the, in my studio with all these bed sheets available to me. I had time to do that because of the distancing that we needed to do and the puppeteer's business on being down on the farm, starting the garden and all that. So I had, I don't know how much time. So I could paint all these panels uh, relatively leisurely and uh, then I, you, naturally looked for uses of them. So we make shows by using that encyclopedia of made things that's available to us. It's huge barn chapters and stories full of stuff in, in, in way of paintings and sculptures that, that were originally made for participating in something that wants to address the public about the the current situation. So, yeah, these were not painted. Each painting has a different theme in it and so forth. And when they were painted, they were not painted for this show. It's the other way around. They were first painted and then the show was made according to what is, was available in these pictures. You, you, your text writing for the show, you're not writing dialogue in this case, certainly not writing dialogue for puppet characters or any other characters, but instead you're writing in a kind of manifesto style or, you know, a preaching kind of style. That might not be the right word. But Sermonizing. I, <laughs> Sermonizing like an old fashioned preacher. Oh, yo, yo, yo. Yeah, that's how it is. A lot of it, yeah. Well, a lot of it is inspired by situation, naturally. It's very harsh for people to be locked up, as we all are. The, the learning of how to live is in that, especially for artists, for people who want to be outwardish and going out and, 
and showing and connecting with people and, and finding what the mind needs to speak with and, and add. And uh, yeah, so these, the colors, the, 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 the pine forest trees, when all this is there, what do you call it? Site specific work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, why don't we go to the third clip, which, um, uh, b well, between the last clip and the next clip, uh, the puppeteers and it, and you and have, have have paraded out from the pine forest into the pageant field that that Elka described earlier, and there there's puppets in waiting. And the last part, the third part of the show, if I'm counting correctly, takes place there. So, um, Emily, let's let's see that.
That's that's where the clip ends, I believe. Yeah, good. Oh, I, I hope that's safe when you <laughs> but you're wearing a mask. Yeah. Um, I was thinking that uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is that I mean this is this show is uh, a number of things. It's it's obviously in, in response to these kind of uh, global responses to the death of George Floyd and others, and also the, the pandemic. But, um, but of course, it, in, in, in your style of theater, you're not addressing the story of George Floyd directly. What, like, what would you say to someone who was confused, or I don't know if they'd be confused, but uh, what would you say to someone who might who might wonder about your choice of images and objects and scale and text and music uh, as a response to the 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 killings of 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 black folks by police uh, in such an abstract way? Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't seem all that abstract to me when a bunch of uh, black or brown legs get attacked by a black and white boot and then the people uh, become fists who have formerly been these boots and knock out the boot <laughs> and sing to the goddess who produced them uh, the lines of Greta Thunberg saying well why don't we change the system itself if the thing can't change. Is, that, is that, that doesn't seem all that abstract. It's just that it's a simplification of reality. I have no interest in doing a movie or a realistic portrayal of anything whatsoever. So the the uses of of colors and paints and cardboard for making legs be to be the population instead of uh, getting Mr. Griffiths to hire 10,000 uh, performers. Yeah, no, a bunch of legs will do made from cardboard, in my opinion. And the, the, you mentioned uh, the text by Greta, Greta Thunberg, Gre Greta Thunberg. Is, that, is yeah. that the text that people are singing at the very end? Yeah, they used the Sacred Harp song and they said it to, they, they, took the words away and replaced them with Greta Thunberg's words. Okay. And okay. there are several verses and I wish they would have sung all three verses yes. or four. Yes. So, but in this particular performance, there are only one verse. I, I noticed, uh, I wanted to mention that this show is titled Insurrection and Resurrection Services, which is an interesting word. It's not tragedy or performance, it's services. And I, I wondered if you could talk about what you mean by services. Well, services, for example, when you do a funeral, you call that a service. I remember my friend Richard Tyler in New York City, the Iranian ambassador, mm -hmm. this is team of alchemy players who was my first collaborator on the first thing I did in New York in 62, uh, which was called a Dance of Death. And he performed with me there. He thought of the role of artists as being funeral directors, of doing the missing services that our society is unable or unwilling or uh, incompetent to do. They have lost the contact with the ancient world in which funeral was important. And the afterlife of those who diseased was included into the new life. And 
I feel the exact same way that the voices of those who have been cut short have to be elevated, have to be utilized in our life, must be present with us, and they deserve that service from us, that we don't just put them in the soil, but we elevate them out of the soil and make them heard. And that's the meaning of service. It, it, it seems to me it's, it's part of the way that bread and puppets work has avoided being simply theater or entertainment in other ways, but is connected to rituals like, you know, um, uh, early on the uh, Easter stories and Christmas stories or the passion plays, the many passion plays or your connection to uh, insurrection masses, like the, the, the way you're thinking about the nature and function of, of these performances is much more what uh, academics would might say is performative. In other words, you're like you're in you're providing a, a funeral service, but it's also a service to the community or the, the service to the people who are watching rather than entertainment. Does that make sense yeah. in some way? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, no, they, I wouldn't know why to do entertainment because it, it exists already. There is so much of it, there are so many choices and so forth that anybody can tickle themselves behind each ear separately and so forth. Yeah, whatever you want is available. So to help that industry go along or be diversified, I have no interest whatsoever. I'd like to bore people stiff if possible or keep them where they are, or have them run away from it, or whatever is necessary to start a revolution in this goddamn political mess here. Or, yeah, to get out of this capitalist disaster that we sacrifice nature to and sacrifice the majority of people's lives to. It's a system that's designed by the designers for the designers and they are billionaires and idiots and they have no idea what they're doing as a matter of fact. They are just innocent of the horror that's being created by taking this wonderful world away from its inhabitants. And that's what we are in and we live in this we, and we can't just live in it we must struggle against that situation so it's just a little paper mache and cardboard that's struggling there but it also has its spirit and maybe that spirit implants itself in eyes and ears and feet and hands of the people who watch it and then it goes somewhere else that's the only way to do it the other revolutions, the ones that aren't done with marshmallows, but with machine guns have, have all failed. So the only thing that's left is paper mache. Uh, and sourdough rye. Yeah, and sourdough rye. Did you see that bread, John? Yes. That's just rye bread, that's pumpernickel. <clears throat> that I should tell people a little bit about this dark rye bread, this yeah. Westphalian peasant bread. It's traditional there, it got its name from when Napoleon invaded uh, Westphalia. Uh, an officer leaned down from his horse and the peasant gave him a piece of bread. And the officer said, took a bite and mm, uh, spit it out and said, oh, bon pour Nicole, that was the name of his horse. And then the peasant said, oh, pumpernickel. God, so it's called pumpernickel. <laughs> I didn't know <laughs> but, that. But that bread is the most the densest bread. It's denser than Russian rye bread because it includes a lot of sprouted rye berries. Half of the batter is sourdough, the other half is sprouted rye berries. And it's not, that's not the only distinction. The other one is that you bake it uh, for very slow in a covered pan. So you, I, I use 12 hours for baking it and the heat has to be right. So in the winter time, our wood stove that heats our kitchen is a low firing 
but it has, has that kind of low temperature. I can leave it in there for 12 hours. And in the summer, I use our normal Quebecois style the, the clay ovens that we have outside. And if people would know that, they would all build those ovens because this one five gallon bucket of pine wood, not a hard wood that we use for heating the houses, but pine wood that people don't use for burning around here. I can bake 50 loaves of pumpernickel. Over how long the time? Over those 10, 12 hours that it's done there. So you, you light the oven, you let the flames go for an hour, then everything is burned out to embers, put a little, little piece of cardboard and a few twigs in it to give it a short flame before you put the loaves in. And then you keep them, you close the door, tighten it with some wet towel, and then you do hold, 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 little magic, and then it goes. <laughs> then you take it out and, mm, yeah, that's the bread. <laughs> I know for, for, for some of us who, who've been involved with bread and puppet theater or like bread and puppet theater, but, or do, who make theater ourselves, puppet theater ourselves, but aren't bakers, sometimes it's, it, uh, we, or I forget about, the the bread aspect of of bread and puppet but you've you've said more than once that you know the the more important thing is is the giving of bread the gift of of the bread and the puppets are uh you know an an, an add-on to that i mean i think you're being facetious well, they create, but... the puppets create the occasion otherwise people wouldn't do it when I, had, when I came to Vermont and we put bread out on the table, said free bread, nobody came. But then when we did a puppet show, then they were happy to be served bread. <laughs> right now, John, we are having a table, a bag of free little uh, of these pumpernickels at Couriers. And they go every day, you know, like every other day we go, bring them 10, ten loaves and local people have possibly never eaten pumpernickel. They come and pick up the bread. And we also do it in the museum. We have a box there with free bread. So yeah, it's free bread. It's bread that's made. This is still made from rye. No, this is a mix now of rye that we grow ourselves and rye that we purchase for, you know, for the whole year. And that the, your growing of your own rye and you're making the bread and distributing that, that's, I, mean, I think that's very different yeah. from most theater in, in the United States. And, and the giving <laughs> of the bread is, um, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 to my mind, it's related to this idea of service, the, the way that your shows uh, figure differently than other forms of, you know, entertaining theater. The, the, the context, what happens during the shows is, is quite a bit different from, from normal theater work or puppet theater work. Yeah, there's hardly any relationship between merchandising and giving. Giving is, is fear in itself. And merchandising is, is fear in itself. People have to merchandise because they need money to pay rent and so forth. But when you have a chance to give something, then this is the higher way of relationship to other human beings. That's what you want to do. You wouldn't sell uh, bread to your kids, so you shouldn't sell it to your neighbors either. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, the, the nature of collaboration. And when, when you and I spoke on the phone a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about the, the collaborative nature of Bread and Puppet. And I think that many people uh, think of a theater like Bread and Puppet as you know, the work of you know, one person, you being the director, um, and then a, a bunch of other people who help you. And maybe they imagine that, um, uh, like like other directors, I think of Robert Wilson, perhaps, but, but I'm sure others are like that, who sort of design the whole thing and then collaborators help or, or 
performers help. But it seems to me that uh, the way that you work, uh, if I'm not wrong, you, I've seen you bring in people as creators or collaborators in the work uh, in, in ways that, like to my mind, are uh, interesting or, or fulfilling. But I wondered if you could talk about that. You have the Bread and Puppet as a strong visual style, which is, of course, your own. But in the creation of the shows, and you've mentioned it a few times in what we've talked about here, in the creation of the shows, it seems to me you're pulling in or inviting, I don't know how, how you think of it, the, the uh, contributions of others. How does collaboration work with you? Mm, well, you were in the theater, so you can tell people that the solo artist idea uh, isn't typical. The, the, it's, it's a pity when people think of art as being soloistic, or when art institutions that educate young artists guide them in that direction of that a picture is a picture and then there's a gallery and that's a commercial enterprise and so forth, or a poem is a poem and then there's a magazine and it goes into that. All these outlets and uses of things are totally suspicious and shouldn't be trusted and shouldn't even be utilized. It's way better if you create all that stuff in, in a new way that fits the moment, that's appropriate for the moment. The puppeteers are all poets and painters, painters and musicians, and they do things and utilize it, and they do it. We have cheap art buses, cheap art tables, where people put poetry and, and, and art and graphics and what have you. It's all, yeah, I mean, we have to invent it. Yeah, we need new ways of what these things are for and how you bring them to the public. When we were in, the, in, the, in New York City, I remember we had a friend who worked in an office where they had a, what was it called, a duplicating machine? What was it called? Oh, mimeograph? Zero, no, it was something before Xerox. So mimeograph. Mimeograph, right. So we could make little books and by folding a sheet and bummer, and this guy printed them for us, terrific. And then we made a cardboard box, like you see a bar box out of our and went out in the street and we sold them uh, one for 25 cents, two for 10 cents, three for a nickel. <laughs> and we dispersed them. And had the fun of making fun of money at the same time. Yeah. In, a, in a, thinking of this collaboration idea I'm pursuing, um, did, are, in a show like Insurrection and Resurrection Services, are you thinking, he, I've got, for example, these panels and some idea, are, um, are there particular moments when you say, well, for this particular, part of the show, I don't know what's going to happen. This would be a good time to invite others to invent things for it. Is that a balance for you? Like some things are clear to, in your mind and other things you yeah. want help with? Yeah, but it also has to do with who is in the company, you know? So I have worked with Josh Krugman and Amelia in other shows with string instruments. And I, I knew they were eager to do these things. So I gave them text and then we tried it out and then we, yeah, and it was a real good performance of theirs. And we are going to develop that to do more of that and see where it goes. Yeah, the, the music part of it is quite intriguing to have spread upon, but other aspects of it also, you know, when you get a good narrator, when you get somebody who moves well, when you get, the, 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 there are so many things and people that they want to have an outlet for, that they want to speak with, and to make that part of the show, this, these desires, these individualistic desires, is an important part of any show. So in part, are you trying to create moments or opportunities for that kind of individualistic desire, as you put it? 
to create? Yeah, I think so. That's part of the making of a show is mm -hmm. to expose the beauty of these humans with their commitment to the politics that we are talking about and their commitment to this kind of address to an audience. And then this services, it's even more because it's an address to the dead. It's an address to people who aren't there and to the rotten politics that ruined their lives. So, yeah, it's, it goes in those very opposite directions at the same time. I was thinking that, for example, uh, our friend Eddie Haynes is a, a skillful lawnmower oh, operator, yeah. and so yeah. you managed to in, that. include that. Well, have you ever seen somebody dance with a lawnmower? No. You should have seen the whole piece. When he started, he had a whole big solo piece of just going over the fields and yeah. whirling around. <laughs> we people we shared the link um, of of the whole piece so people can watch Eddie's lawnmower dance. Yeah, uh, that he's going to probably get the Golden Globe or the Nobel lawnmowing prize <laughs> right, for the best lawnmowing dance with demon yeah. mask. Right. Um, so there there are people uh, like Pedro Adorno and Kati who are saying hello. Uh, there's a lot of um, interesting uh, comments here. There's a, a question from someone, uh, Tamara Romanchik. How long does it take Peter to carve a picture for a banner? What, what the length of the process is from start to finish? Mm, oh, well, the carving of these sheets, I think at least an hour and a half, I would say, something like that. Normally I carve fast and furious. And then these big ones, you have to turn around. And I would think, yeah, sometimes that one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, about an hour and a half for those four by eight sheets, I would say. For, okay. But it's the, it's, it depends on the speed and whether the tools are, right now this masonite quality isn't very good. So I'm struggling a little bit with the tools to get them sharp and so on. But yeah, but I'm, 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 I'm used to doing it fast, so. Here's a, here's a question that actually relates to a, a question I wanted to ask too. For, this is from uh, Mirza Hosseini Fahime, perhaps. Uh, how much does poetry affect your performances? Uh, very much so. Does anybody speak German? Can I give you one? Yes, of course. <laughs> Mit gelben Birnen hänget und voll mit wilden Rosen das Land in den See. Ihr holden Schwäne und trunken von Küssen tunkt ihr das Haupt ins heilig nüchterne Wasser. Weh mir, wo nehm ich? Weh mir. Blumen und Sonnenschein. Wenn, wo nehme ich, wenn es Winter ist, die Blumen und den Sonnenschein und Schatten der Erde? Die Mauern stehen sprachlos und kalt. Im Winde klirren die Fahnen. It's hölderlich. And how, what, how, um, thinking of uh, Mirza Hosseini Fahime from Tehran, his question, how, how do you think of that Holderlin text? I, 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 and I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't, wasn't able to under, translate that or understand yeah. it, but, but why does that text, particular Holderlin text appeal to you and how does it help you make puppet theater? Oh, <laughs> Elka reads Emily Dickinson to me several times a week during the evenings. And I read to her, Hölderlin or Kleist or whatever I find, what I find, or Jakob Böhme. It's a, it's a, it's a, a world that the ordinary doesn't know. It's, it's the extraordinary, it's the world that transforms the ordinary. It says the things in a 
most unpragmatic way possible. It says him in their real relationship. So the sky is the sky. It's not a mix of chemicals and what have you. It's that's. Maybe we, I'm, I, okay, I'm, enough sorry I, I'm sorry if I interrupted you, but I, I, and like we think of Kleist and Holderlin as, well, Holderlin is a romantic poet and Kleist along those lines, or so, and, and, and Dickinson too is so abstract. I, I mean, I don't know how she's termed. Uh, uh, and, in other words, the, the, they're not they're not writing poetry that it's immediately accessible. Uh, right. Maybe I'm in a very pedestrian way reiterating what what you've just said about the about the Holderlin poem. No, they're Holderlin. difficult because they they don't trust language. They reinvent language. Mm -hmm. They don't trust communication. They reinvent communication. They want to go to where does the word that you use come from? Where does the structure of the sentence, how is it? They destroy the sentence. They take it apart and redo it. Mm -hmm. They put the word opposite another word that you have never thought of would belong there. Mm -hmm. And they create a clearness, a clarity that doesn't exist in normal communication. Um, Michelle Owing, who actually, who's a, a, a medieval scholar, um, who I, I, I mentioned her work to you from Yale. She did work on medieval performance related to puppetry, but she said the title of that poem is um, Hälfte des Lebens. Hälfte des Lebens. Hälfte des Lebens. So there we are. We can all find that text and maybe translate yeah. it. Hälfte um, des Lebens, which can mean half of life and middle of life. Yeah. Okay. And do you, the way you were just talking about the use of imagery in those poems, is that related to the way you put together images or juxtapose images? Yeah, they, they, exactly. It is very similar. This year we did a whole lot, we called it the School of O, which is learned from a medieval German uh, woman, Mechthild von Magdeburg who writes her most beautiful poetry. It's all, oh, 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 you thorn, oh, you rose, oh, you bumblebee on the rose, oh, you, <laughs> it's enormous. Yeah. School of O. <laughs> School of O, very good. Um, when I told you I wanted to talk about Hölderlin, and um, you said you wanted to mention Jakob Burma, if I'm not mispronouncing that, the 16th century Silesian cobbler and mystic philosopher. Yes, yeah, well, he's an extraordinary figure. Beautiful writing, was oppressed by the township in which he lived. He is a Silesian like me, and since I'm a shoemaker, he also was a shoemaker. <laughs> he, it's a shoe of a man, and he was a shoemaker professionally, and he wrote fantastically, and he sort of created that whole idea that divinity isn't against uh, satanic opposites, but includes the satanic opposites. So good and evil are in the same, they are the same, and they split from each other. So it's a, it's a huge, wonderful uh, theological enterprise to read in him and, and, and beautiful, fantastic Baroque language. So I'm, written during, pretty much during the, the Thirty Years' War, like Grimmelshausen and other of the greatest writers. Yeah. And is that, would you, is fant fantastic and Baroque something that, is that something, a term that could apply to your, your, your work? <laughs> Baroque. Yeah. A lot of people say decoration. Right. No, Baroque. it's, Baroque it's different than different. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's some, uh, I, I know may you have to go prepare dinner or Elka needs to go prepare dinner. 
but um, uh, uh, there's a maybe there's a couple of questions here. One is, do your do your musicians create their own compositions to each piece? No, not to each piece, but to a lot of pieces. And most of our compositions we work on in rehearsal, or they are entirely improvised, like Josh and Amelia today. So we did not work on these pieces musically. They worked on it. But it was based on improvisational music we had done together over the last few years. And um, I'm just writing something. Um, I, from Eriberto Padilla Colazzo, I can see that you use art and puppetry with much responsibility. How's the usual response from your audience in these types of raw political performances? Oh my God, right now we, our, as you saw in the picture, we have only 10 people audiences, 20 people audience. They, they delight in eating the pumpernickel with the garlic on it in the end. We all have things over our mouths. We can barely communicate at six foot distance with each other. This is one of the distresses. We don't even know what is with our audience, but we know they come, they go. There's very little communication right now because of the situation. I can't answer that question. Um, Rosa Luisa Marquez asked, is, is Peter thinking about the play he is going to create tomorrow, or is he into doing, into doing, and that doing creates the next show? <laughs> Rosa, I have an envelope for you in the mail, and for Pedro. <laughs> then, no, it's... Uh, it's hard to say. We need to, right now, we are so obliged to figure out something that is spatially correct for our audience, that respects their distances and ours from them and all of that. So we are fussing a lot of how do we do that? Where do we park the cars? How do we get people from the car to this and that place? How, which piece of landscape is easiest accessible for them, not the best for us to perform? Where is the biggest seating area where they can be separate from all that? How do they eat the bread? We use the peels. I don't know if you know Baker's peel. It's like the water of a rowboat. Long paddle. And we put the bread on there, a paddle, and we hand out the bread on leaves of, what w, okay. of comfrey and hand it to them that way. So we are trying to be as clean and right with all this as can be, but it's a lot of fussing and thinking and, and redoing and so on. Yes, we are working on the circus. That's our next step till mid-July. We want to try that. How to do But with eight people, I don't know yet how many neighbors we get to come. They also okay. want to be careful. You know. I think everybody's trying to adjust and figure out how to deal with the COVID situation, and you, you're you doing so with some very particular needs and some very particular solutions, which are interesting to see. I've, if there's, if you might have time for a couple of more uh, questions, um, Robert Rogers yeah. said, why do you choose to live in the United States? <laughs> I, don't, I haven't chosen anywhere where I lived ever. It's just... <laughs> I've been driven by various storms and winds, you know, from originally being driven by the war from where we live to another area, totally, totally distant and strange, and from there to somewhere. No, I don't feel I choose. No, it's not this. Plus, this is a beautiful, big country. We don't live in, in the United States of America. We live in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. It's its own little kingdom in Vermont. It's a northeast corner. It's a wonderful landscape. If you could look where I am looking. <laughs> don't advertise it too much. Don't tell, she says, don't tell people about it. But pretty soon the New Yorkers are all buying canoes and coming up the rivers and leaving anyway, because they are going to be flooding, right? And we live in the hills, so. I, I don't know if, um if if what, what your sense of the current political moment is, but in some ways, 
oh, especially when I've talked with younger people about especially the, the demonstrations of the past few weeks, the past month, it, it's really, it's reminded me more than anything else of the experience of the, of the 1960s during the Vietnam War. Um, Hopefully it goes a little further, you know, they, they, it, it almost dropped. It was never understood as, as what it is, that the, the social elements, the reality that it isn't just racism, but that, that racism is deeply out of the social misconstruct of this kind of economy. That it's uh, the same thing with the, the virus now. It affects poor people. It, it affects colored people. It, it affects people who are disadvantaged in so many ways. It's all deeply connected to this impossible construct of political injustice that rules the world. And it's called global do-goody or something like this. I don't know what. Global Santa, yeah, Santa forever, right. And, and maybe, the, uh, maybe this is one of the final questions um, from Ralph Hurwitz from Western Massachusetts. Where are we in terms of fermentation and uprising and radical cheese? <laughs> we should, <laughs> good question. We did a few of those. We should do them again. I agree with you. The, we did the radical cheese festivals here there's good attendance and the, it was a get together of radical showmakers and sauerkraut makers and that was a good idea because sauerkrauting and, and sourdough making and radical brewing of puppet shows all are related and need to be related and radical music making as well. Bye bye, I have to go. Okay. So Pedro Rosa, Pupak, all of you friends there. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Elka, for you, the time you took to share with us your work. Um, you'll be, Bread and Puppet will be performing all summer. I, it, as I understand it, you're still working out exactly how audiences can right. come in a safe, healthy right. way. But I'm imagining that information might be posted on the the, the Bed and Puppet website. So, if, I and I think yeah. the museum, I think the Bed and Puppet Museum is going to be open it's this open summer. No, we opened it. Yeah, it's open now. Well, you so, have to inspect the instructions when you go in, but it's open now. Yeah. And um, thank you, thank you both. I would just like to, maybe you're stepping away. And we thank you for, for, for doing that. And it's fine, no problem. I wanted to mention that uh, this, this, uh, this forum will be posted on our YouTube page and you can look at it on our Facebook page. And I wanted to mention that the next forum on uh, Thursday, July, July 2nd will be with Claudia Orenstein at four o'clock. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, there's a trash, trash monster workshop at two o'clock with um, Elise Van Ness, and next Wednesday, July 1st, a paper mache workshop with Felicia Cooper, who among other things uh, has worked with Bread and Puppet and gleaned a lot from that. So thanks, Elka. So, um, and thanks to, uh, <laughs> thanks, Peter. Thanks uh, to um, Emily Wicks uh, from the Ballard Institute and and Felicia Cooper, uh, our graduate assistant who's helping. Thanks to everybody who's watching. We appreciate it. See you later.